Okay, here we go. Um, I'm going to run through this PowerPoint and um, feel free to jump ahead to wherever we got to in class and continue or use this as a resource for later on. So we're going to talk about how to present data. So the first thing that we've um, talked about hopefully in class is why we use tables and hopefully a lot of things that we talked about were things like you know keeping data organized um, so that um, we can sort of group data as you can see here we have in this first column here the individual who made this as the trials going down this way um, and then they have the various different pieces of information in every next column so that it's very easy to look up and see that in trial 4 here we had you know this data for this particular variable this one for this variable etc cetera, etc cetera. so we can kind of very easily group and organize data it's a nice way to keep things neat and tidy um, it's really important to include all of these components here title uh, we like to use this particular format uh, right here uh, let's see can I can I highlight don't know that I can um, but we like to use this particular format right here, table one, or if you have more tables, table two, table three, table four. So you can kind of identify each table within the text as you're describing it. Um, and it's the effect of the IV on the DV, because that's essentially what your experiment was. Then we have labels um, for all of the columns to identify what um, uh, is in each of those columns. Uh, we always have the units in the columns, not in the actual cells, because essentially we want to make sure that the units in all of the um, in in one particular column are the same. You don't want to change units in between, um, and so it also just saves you having to write it out each time in every single cell. Also, when it comes to using the data table in Excel or on a computer, if you put the units in the cell, the computer's not going to have a clue what you're talking about when you're asking it to do averages. And of course, we want to include grid lines as well, just from a formatting perspective, keeping it neat and tidy. It helps us as a viewer to organize the, to write the data in. It also helps the viewer, sorry, um, uh, to sort of go along a row or down a column. It's just much more um, pleasing to the eye to be able to do it like that. Um, the rule of thumb we're going to use this year is that we're going to put the IV in the first column, and then um, the trials for all of the dependent variables in all of the other columns. So if we were to draw a table here, we would have the IV here, and then we would have each of the trials going along here. So trial one, oh, sorry, trial two, etc., etc. And then we would have a header row right here for the DV with units. Voila, please excuse the handwriting. So, then, in class, hopefully we talk to each other about why we use graphs. One of the interesting things is that um, we're all primates, as you know. We came from monkeys and apes. Um, and as a result, we've evolved to be able to see pictures um, and recognize visual information very, very efficiently and effectively. In fact, from a very early age, um, human beings are able to recognize faces um, very, very easily, more easily than anything else, and especially um, facial expressions. Babies can um, interpret facial expressions from a very early age, um, much sooner than um, any other kinds of visual information. So uh, is, as we can sort of get this visual information, we can really get a very good sense as to what's going on. We have a trend going up, and that's very intuitive for us. But a big block of numbers is very hard to tell. Okay, so um, every good graph has certain aspects to it because what we're trying to do um, as we draw the graph is we're trying to essentially portray information. The first thing we're going to have is a title. Notice again we have the same format, graph 1. We could have lots of different graphs, but we're going to call this one graph 1. It's the first graph that we're going to show, the effect of IV on DV. So in this case, the effect of colored light on the growth of bean plant. We want to have axes where the x-axis is the independent variable. Now in mathematics I understand that um, a lot of you are putting uh, time on the x-axis and generally speaking that's because time is often the independent variable. Um, but you know as a scientist you're going to be choosing what independent variable you want. Um, so for instance with the termites you might have had color or brand of pen or anything like that. 
x-axis. The y-axis then is going to be the dependent variable. Um, now I do notice that here that uh, x and y-axis don't have any labels on it, which is not very good. Um, and I'm going to assume that's something about the import of the PowerPoint into this program here that I'm using. Um, but we'll we'll put those on that later on. Um, <clears throat> we're going to have labels, and that's what I was talking about in terms of the axes. So we're going to have labels down here. So we would have the IV on the bottom. And in this case, it's the effect of colored light on the growth of bean plants. And I'm going to guess that this is over time. So I'm going to guess that this is sort of days down here. Um, and probably write time, and then put days in parentheses because they're the units for the time. And then uh, on the side here, we're going to have the growth of bean plants. So it starts at 10, so that must have um, started at a certain height. So we're going to say height, and we'll put the units, let's say centimeters. There we go. Um, and so notice again, we have the units in there in parentheses. Again, x-axis has the IV, that's the IV, and then the y-axis here has the DV, the dependent variable. Uh, I've already talked about that, we have unit. We have a scale. Notice that this scale allows all the data to fit on one page. Um, if we'd gone up to 15 days, this graph would be kind of useless because we don't get it there. Also notice that we, we have it extend all the way down. We don't try and cram uh, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10 into this tiny space, sorry that's meant to be a 10, into this tiny space here, we're really extending it all the way down so we can use the entire length there. Uh, again, just using space on the page and just spreading the data out. There's no reason to jam it all in there. But also notice that each of these um, increases here is the same gap. As we go up, we have 10 centimeters um, going up. It would be um, very strange to see this increasing by a different number each time. So for instance, let's say this was 10, and this was 30, and this was 70. That is a very strange scale. Um, there are some rhythms and things like that, which we don't need to talk about. Um, so we have a legend. The legend is over here, otherwise known as the key, and it describes the additional variables. Um, in this particular title here, it doesn't talk about time being a factor. What I'd really love to see is over time, because this then indicates that this particular graph and this particular experiment has two independent variables. It has um, the colored light and it has time. Two independent variables and one dependent variable, that is the growth. So we use the, um, the legend <coughs> to um, identify other additional IVs. All right, so let's talk about the different kinds of graphs that we have. We have a bar graph. Now these are for comparing values of a single variable among several different groups. And the key word or the operative word here is groups. Um, the x-axis is a categorical independent variable. A categorical independent variable is where there is no um, uh, in-between of, in this case, brand 1 and brand 2. It is either brand 1 or it is brand 2. Um, an example I like to give is if we were, for instance, graphing the effect of gravity on different planets. All right. So we have our uh, Earth. We'll, we'll make this Mars. Um, and we have uh, Jupiter as well. We'll plan it with rings there. Uh, we have uh, Pluto. Pluto, little blue dot out there. And there's, there's no in-between planet. I mean, yes, there are planets in between Jupiter and Pluto, but there's no merger of Jupiter and Pluto. It's not like you have a planet Pupiter. Um, it, it's just Jupiter or Pluto, um, never some in-between. And therefore, you would have it as a categorical independent variable because you would have one planet in this bar and one planet in that bar and one planet in this bar. Uh, forget the order there, I just threw things in. 
On the y-axis, then, you have a continuous value. In other words, it could be any number in between here. It doesn't need to be either 10 or 20. It could be any number in there, and there is an infinitesimal number of numbers in between each number. That's what continuous means. It could be 10, it could be 10.001, 10 10.0001, 10.0000002. It really could be anything, and that's what we mean by continuous. We'll use patterned bars in order to represent um, extra variables. So in this case here, we have... Oh, I'm having a hard time reading it, again, because of the import. The effect of paper towel brand on the average liquid uh, absorbed, I'm going to guess. And so in reality, what we would do is we would color in one of these as... Um, let's say this is juice, and then juice would be here and juice would be here, and juice would be here, and water would be the one without any color in it whatsoever. The most frustrating as a, as, um, a science teacher for me is when students, um, or it's not even students actually, even adults who should know better, they just decide to throw um, random colors into all these random different bars to make it look pretty. No doubt it looks very pretty, though sometimes I find it a little garish and off-putting. But um, the colored should be really used to indicate different variables, so you can um, see between them. Graph would be a pie chart. Pie chart's excellent for comparing parts of a whole. Um, great for showing percentages. So for instance, you might say um, the percentage of um, students wearing different colored t-shirts in uh, school one day. So obviously you would have, let me use a black pen, you would have something like blue shirts here, and red shirts here, and yellow. This is obvious. I don't need to continue. Um, but there is some whole, because the whole in this case would be the whole student population. And so you can see how that all breaks down as a part of a whole. The next one is an XY scatter plot. So an XY scatter plot is simply where you um, are putting X's or little dots or whatever it is on your axis. And in this case, this is two continuous variables, meaning that this here could be any number in between any of these points, and this here could be any number in between any of these points. Um, an example, again, you know, going back to the, um, the time and height of plant, you might have time here and height here. And again, those are all numerical in value, and the time could be any time, uh, and the height could be any height. And therefore, um, those are two continuous variables. Again, x-axis independent variable, y-axis dependent variable. A multiple line graph, and this goes back to that um, height of plant over time using different colored light. This is where you have two continuous variables and a categorical variable. And so what happens here is the x-axis is the independent variable that is continuous. Uh, continuous. The dependent variable is also continuous. And then the legend or the key would be used for the categorical variable. Categorical. Um, and again, that, that idea of um, watching a plant grow over time, again, the time is the continuous dependent variable, or sorry, continuous independent variable, so this would be the time. The height here would be the dependent um, variable, which is also continuous, and then the categorical variable would be the color of the light because it's either red or blue. And yes, okay, there's all sorts of shades in between there, but as a scientist, you used a red light bulb or you used a blue light bulb. You didn't change the light using a continuous um, spectrum of color. You just chose a different light bulb, and there was no in-between. And so that is, by definition, categorical. So the next one... Oh, this is a question. What's the best bar graph for depicting day of the week versus hours of homework. So I'm going to give you a minute to think about this. And what you want to be thinking about is how many variables you have and whether those variables are categorical or continuous. So, first, 
let's identify our independent variable, the thing that changes the dependent variable. Well, what is it that we're measuring? Hours of homework, and therefore this is the dependent variable, that is the thing we're changing. And the independent variable, therefore, the item which is changing the dependent variable, is day of the week. That is the independent variable. Next, each one of these variables is either categorical or continuous, and so which is which? Hopefully that you can see that the dependent variable is pretty clearly continuous, because um, you could have any amount of homework, um, continu wait, continuous, wait a minute, how many U's are there in that, um, blanking right now, it's late, um, but the dependent variable is continuous, meaning you could have no homework, you could have 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, 50 minutes, let's hope it's not too much more, but you might have three hours over the weekend or something like that, um, and so that really could be anything, and any number in between, so that is continuous. Day of the week, on the other hand, it's either Monday or it's Tuesday, or it's Wednesday, Thursday, etc., etc. It's never some combination of Monday and Tuesday. It's never Moose Day, right? There's no such thing as Moose Day, because before midnight, it's Monday. After midnight, it's Tuesday. And it's a very um, binary thing. And therefore, the independent variable here is categorical. They are categories of the week. So we have the dependent variable is continuous, the categorical variable is, is um, the independent variable, and so the best graph for this one is the bar graph. And if we were to draw it, it would look something like this, with the day down here, and then the um, homework here, and you'd have bars going up like this. Next one. What is the independent variable in the examination of day of the week versus hours of homework? Please ignore this here. That is a remnant from our clickers. Um, but what is the independent variable in the examination of day of the week versus hours of homework? Well, we've already sort of discussed that. Um, that is day of the week. That is the item that is changing. And then the hours of homework are changing as a result of that change of day of the week. Question. Oh, okay. What's the best graph for depicting the effect of time after release on the speed of a dropped ball? Again, please ignore this. So, what do we think here? Well, we have time after release that is continuous. Speed of a dropped ball, that is also continuous. Both of those are numerical, and those numbers can be anything. And therefore, we have two continuous variables. Only one independent variable, and obviously only one dependent variable. And so our answer is xy scatterplot. And our graph would look something like this. where we had speed here, and we had time here. Now when we draw those lines in between the points, we're going to actually going to get to what that is. But there's a difference between a line graph and an xy scatterplot. And in general, in science, what we're going to do is we are going to just do xy scatterplots, and we'll add in that line later on called a trend line, or a line of best fit. So, in this case, what is the dependent variable in the experiment that we just talked about? testing the effect of time after release on the speed of a drop ball. I'll give you a minute to think about that. Did you get it? Well, what is the thing that's changing as a result? Type of ball? No. Drop height? I hope not. That's the control variable. Same with the type of ball. The speed of the drop ball? Yes. That is the variable that's changing as a result of the time changing. So that is the dependent variable. Alright. 
what's, and again ignore this, what's the best graph for depicting the color of shirt worn by all students in the seventh grade? Well, this is the example that I just gave earlier, so hopefully you will be able to answer this question in three seconds, two seconds, one second. Pie chart. Again, it is depicting um, a hole, and therefore um, then the uh, the uh, the other variable or the color is categorical, and so um, our pie chart is just going to be divided just like this pie chart is over there. But we're going to have the different colors represented by the different areas. Okay. <clears throat> What is the best graph for depicting the height of male and female gophers as they age? By the way, a gopher is something like that. It's like a little groundhog. The best graph for depicting the height of male and female gophers as they age. I'm going to give you a minute to think about that. All right, how did you do? Well, let's go through this. The height of male and female growthers as they age. So what is being measured? Well, hopefully you've identified that height is the variable that's being measured. And what are variables that are changing that height? Well, obviously as the gophers get older, I assume those gophers are going to get taller. And so age is going to be one of the independent variables. And I expect that the way I phrased that has indicated or given you a clue that there might be more than one independent variable. So what is the other independent variable? Right. Gender. Notice that gender in this case is categorical. We either have male gophers or we have female gophers. All right. So this is the other IV, the other independent variable. But wait, we have two independent variables. We've only discussed, well, we've discussed two um, uh, different kinds of graphs that that could be. It could be a multi-bar graph or it could be a multi-line graph. So which one could it be? Multi-bar graph, multi-line graph. The multi-bar graph is going to be looking at two categorical independent variables, whereas the multi-line graph is going to be one categorical independent variable and one continuous independent variable. In this case, gender is categorical. And with age, that is continuous because the age could be any number that it wanted, well, up until the gopher died. So in that case, we are going to be using a multi-line graph. All right, so we've just answered this, so identify the correct answer. Independent variable in this is uh, the gender of the gopher, yes, the age of the gopher, yes, and therefore our answer is this one, two and three. All right. Next, uh, we've got some additional terms here that we're going to identify. We've got line of best fit, interpolation, extrapolation, and error bar. The line of best fit is known as the trend line. <clears throat> now, in this particular graph, this is not really a true um, line of best fit because as you'll see, each one of those dots is joined by a straight line. But notice how the line changes its slope throughout this based on where those points are. Now, when we draw a line of best fit, we're not going to be doing that. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be drawing a straight line 
as straight as we can between all the dots where we try and get as many or the same number of dots above the line as below the line. Now then, let me see if I can do that. Um, it's tricky without a ruler. You really want to try it with a ruler. Well, that's no good at all. Well, it's not bad. It's not straight. But anyway. So this would be a linear line of best fit. What do I mean by linear? Y equals mx plus b. That is a linear equation for a linear line of best fit. But of course, as you look at those variables, consider to yourself, would age and height actually be linear? I mean, if we were to map that out over time, it probably wouldn't be, right? I mean, you don't continue growing for the rest of your life. In reality, what we'd find is, we'd find it looking more like that. But of course, with little growth spurts put in there for good measure. Well, <clears throat> in that case, a line of best fit might not actually be the appropriate um, uh, tool to use for um, a graph of age on height. But um, nevertheless, a trend line is usually a straight or um, singularly curved line uh, where you're trying to fit the best kind of mathematical representation of the data. Again, with about half of the points above the line and about half of the points below the line. So interpolation and extrapolation uses the line of best fit. And what we're doing is we're trying to predict or estimate a value that was not collected as a original data. So as we go through each one of those, we can see, first of all, interpolation is going to predict a value within the range of the original data. So for instance, what was the height at 10.5 years? Well, I'm going to assume that every one of these points is actually um, one extra year. So, and this is where my somewhat useless pen... No, that's not even close. Hang on a minute. Try that again. Well, that's a bit better. Not great, though. What we would do is draw a line straight across from where we think 10.5 is. You would do a much better job of that than I just did. Again, that is interpolation. Notice that that previous one was in between the lines. Next, extrapolation is where you predict a value beyond the range of the original data. Notice, extra. You're going extra data. So in this case, we're being asked, what was the height at 25 years? Well, again, notice on my particular graph, I don't even see number 20. That's why it's quite useful to always make sure that your, your um, axis extends a little bit beyond your original or your final data point, because if you want to perform extrapolation, you're going to need that, that real estate. So, again, if we were using a linear line, and let me try and do this on here, let's say this is 10 and this is 20, and let's say that our data kind of goes like this. We would want to try and make it linear if we thought that was the best fit. Of course, with this graph, you can see that each one of those lines changes slope depending on where the points are. And so extrapolation with this kind of a, um, a line graph is not very doable because it continues to change. That's why we tend to use either one single straight line or a curved line with a particular um, formula to it. You know, like, um, I don't know, an x squared graph or an x cubed graph or a 1 over x, something like that. This way we can actually go beyond the data set and continue the trend so that we can predict something all the way up here, even if we don't have the data for it. Again, that is extra extrapolation. The last one is using error bars. And we'll talk more about error bars as a group, and we'll be using error bars on our graph. Error bars are used to show the range of data. Um, when we use a bar graph, we're going to be plotting the average of the data that we might have um, collected. Um, what is this graph even about? It's points scored in the 2007 regular season for the Patriots. Um, and other teams. We've got Patriots, Colts, Dolphins, and Giants. Now, this graph is saying that on average, the Patriots scored approximately 37 points per game. 
the Colts scored approximately 27 points per game, the Dolphin approximately 26 points per game, and the Giants approximately, sorry, not 26, 16, and the Giants approximately 22, 23 points per game. Well, that's all averages, but as you know, every game is different. And so, the error bars are used to show the spread of data. And what we do is we use um, one standard deviation above and one standard deviation below. So, for instance, those error bars would then be drawn on so that you can see how varied a particular team was in their scoring. And so you can see in this case that the Dolphins and the Patriots, with these made-up error bars here, the Dolphins and the Patriots had more precise data. Okay? And the Colts, a different color, the Colts and the Giants had less precise data because their range of data is much larger than for the Patriots and the Dolphins. We can use these error bars to talk about whether it's conclusive that one thing is better at scoring than another, um, and we can talk about that next time. All right, that's it from me. Thanks.